Um, I used to be an on-again, off-again smoker. I tried everything to give up, all the tactics, um, NHS smoking cessation clinic, acupuncture, hypnosis, uh, in a really kind of dark day in deepest, darkest suburbia in Sydney with a woman dressed in purple who tapped me all over. That was nice. <laughs> Nothing really stuck, though. One unplanned tactic which um, uh, stuck for a while was a visit back home to my family in Ireland. This is my Irish family. And I, hadn't, I used to go every summer, um, every summer to see my family, but I hadn't actually been for about eight years or so. And in that time, the, the difference in my... There's a lot of smokers in my family, or there were. The difference in my chuffing auntie's skin, beautiful Irish skin, and how it changed over the last eight years kind of shocked me, and I gave up immediately. But still, nothing stuck, until one day in December 2008, a really chilly day, I suddenly realised three things. I hadn't reached for a cigarette in four weeks. I didn't want to. And I'm infinitely brainwashable. I am a marketer's dream. I realized that my very good friend and colleague, Solitaire Townsend, had been fiddling with my brain over the last few months or so. She'd been asking some very, very odd habit, uh, questions about my habit. She'd said, um, so now that you've met your new boyfriend, Aldo, is this a good time to stop, do you think? Followed up with, um, oh, it's a bit funny, have you seen in Futera, our company, how no one actually smokes anymore. You're, you're really one of the last. Following through with one day, very thoughtfully, hmm, you just don't strike me as a smoker. <laughs> so for those of you that know behaviour change tactics, Solly had scored a hat trick. She'd got me with transition zones. She'd pointed out, you know, that in a time of change, my life was under change. I'd met a new fella. I'd moved back from the States. A bamba had just been elected. The whole world seemed in, in flux. She, she asked for some more change. She also used social proof. She pointed out what everyone else in our company was doing, or actually not doing, not smoking. And she used symbolic self-completion. That's labelling. She got me to identify with not being a smoker. And those, those chuffing aunties, well, that's salience. Being able to visibly see the impact of smoking on those who are near and dear to me. So in case you think that I'm kind of profiting terribly from all my auntie's ill health, we've actually all given up. And we've all given up using a combination of these tactics. So they're really powerful. Um, and in fact, really, I kind of should have noticed what she was up to, because where we got these tactics from was from our client work. We'd spent um, some time back in 2004 when we won... Well, actually, what we won was the UK's first national climate change communication strategy. Um, against some rather large agencies. I think BBDO was one of the ones we pipped to the post. And we, I, I actually believe why we won it is that we, what we promised to do before doing any kind of communications planning was to sit down and review all of the evidence base out there on what works in encouraging pro-environmental and social change. So, you know, our, our brief was climate change, but we looked at everything, you know, health, crime, we looked at internationally. Back then, there was actually a little bit less of an evidence base. It probably filled about half this room, so we were actually able to read it all. You know, we had stuff translated from the Swedish, Canada's one-ton challenge. But what really, really struck me then was the number of studies which showed how smokers really overestimated the, the, the ill effects of smoking. So smokers would would uh, overestimate the amount of years that smoking could take off your life, would overestimate the ill effects on heart and lungs, and despite even overestimating these bad effects, would still smoke. So even though I knew this, I kind of wasn't expecting Solly to use these tactics on me. And they're, they're actually so powerful, we've now banned them at Futera HQ. <laughs> it's just not fair. <laughs> You know, even making a cuppa was becoming this kind of subtle minefield of negotiation. And in fact, if you actually never want to make a cup of tea again, then look at the discounting effect. It's very, very useful. You know, I still actually, um, I indulge a little bit outside of work. I'm not in smoking, but in using these uh, tactics every now and again. So that new boyfriend of 2009, married. <laughs> 
So they're really powerful. And whether you're using them at home, whether you're using them to potty train a two-year-old, or whether you're using them to create global change campaigns for good, they really work. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about now. Um, at So at Futera, uh, we work on creating a sizzling, desirable future, a world which unleashes all seven billion of us to lead better, happier, healthier lives. And the way we do that is working with our clients. So for example, with Danone and Kingfisher, we work with their boards to help them become truly restorative businesses who maximize the good they do and really minimize the harm. That's Kingfisher's net positive um, strategy and campaign. We work with Mondelez, the European arm of craft on Coffee Made Happy. That's creating a million coffee entrepreneurs who are respected and sustainable and have status through to Sky Rainforest Rescue, um, reconnecting Sky viewers with the awe and wonder that all of us feel when confronted with characteristic megaflora, such as the Amazon. And so in this case, we use that, that sense of awe to reconnect viewers um, with the Amazon and, and encourage change, a, a conservation campaign, funding, fundraising for conservation. And so we, you know, we're the, the sustainability experts, I'd say. We're an independent agency. Um, so if you are interested in partnering with us, come and see me later. <laughs> because our world is transforming. So for a decade, we've been working in this field. And in that time, and actually particularly recently, we've seen the world transform. Three megatrends um, we see at Futera appearing. Now, I'm not going to tell you lots about people and technology, changes in population, you know, rise of middle class and brick nations, aging populations here, massive explosion in digital and social media, enabling all of us to talk to each other like we've never been able to before. So anyway, all of us are kind of paid a fair bit to know a fair bit about that. I'm not going to say much more about that. But I do want to spend just a moment on the environmental trend, the Anthropocene. I love this. It's, it's brilliant kind of dinner party fodder. It's great pub chat. And it also tells a really powerful story about how influential we are. Uh, okay, so if you can see this, this shows the world. The world over it, it, since, it, since it began. Four and a half billion years old. You can see the four eons um, since we've been around, since the world's been around. And of that last eon, which is 500 million years, which ain't much compared to the four and a half billion years this world has been around, you can see that breaks down into three periods, uh, a number of eras, and just very, very recently, I get quite excited about the Anthropocene. <laughs> just very, very recently, the last 10,000 years, an epoch called the Anthropocene, which refers to the recent age of man and woman. And what this says is that in that last 10,000 years, humanity has become the defining feature by which our planet is shaped. So when people became more powerful than plate tectonics. When did it happen? Uh, well, about 10,000 years. <laughs> and how did it happen? Uh, with the agricultural revolution, with domestication of animals. Just another snap from my family album. That's my sister's dog, uh, Rodney. <laughs> with the domestication of animals and the clearing of land. Well, it's about when this, this kind of change started to come. And it's now speeded up with climate change, biodiversity, loss of natural resources all of which sounds pretty bad. And you're thinking, well, how on earth is this good? Well, I, again, I love this because the naming of things, to paraphrase T.S. Eliot, is a serious matter. And what the Anthropocene says to me is that at the same time, it makes me feel really, really, really small if you look at the, the, the time that our world has been around, but also at the same time, massively powerful. What the Anthropocene does is kind of reverse this, this trend, this scientific trend of flinging man and woman out into the, kind of the edges of the universe. You know, when Copernicus rewrote our solar system, um, Darwin put us at the end of an evolutionary branch, art, religion, all it says has us cowering at the forces of the elements. What the Anthropocene says is, it's people that are driving this change. It's people that are driving the environmental megatrend. And we know that people can change. And the people 
who are best at getting people to change are here in this room. So H.G. Wells said that human history is becoming more and more a race between education and catastrophe. But we've seen that actually being in the know, education means nothing. You know, smokers are, in fact, overestimating uh, the risk, but still smoking. So I actually believe that what we're dealing with here is a race between creativity and catastrophe. So what the hell do we do about it? And we've pulled together at Futera over this decade of experience a few of our just a few of our favorite tactics into a tool. It's kind of the creative toolkit, if you like. It's your ABC for doing change for good. Um, we pulled together a whole load of research from the experts on what works in behavior change. We looked at the companies which are changing already, already you know, the Walmarts, the L'Oreal's, um, the NBC's, um, and we put it into just a little um, pack of 13 cards. It launched last week in San Diego at Sustainable Brands. And it's, it's, it's freely available. You know, if you're quick, we've got a couple of packs here, or you can download it from our site. We believe, really believe, in unleashing ideas. And it's, it's like karma. You give enough ideas away, then the really good ones come back. So they're freely available for everyone to use. Um, and I'm just going to run through a few of them. Uh, just three. The 13, I'm just going to cover three. And I'm going to start with a couple from my smoking example. All right, time. Time is transition zones, the transition zones that I talked about earlier. And transition zones are life changes where change is actually automatically built in. So if you've um, had a baby, if you've moved house, if you've got a new job, if you've retired, if you reflect just for a moment about some of the huge but also tiny habit changes which made that event truly transformational. You know, at these times, our habits kind of unfreeze, and we're actually open to setting new ones. Even little um, changes, payday, seasonal changes, can be really, really useful. And in fact, perhaps the biggest insight I can give you here is less around what behavior you ask your consumer to change, and more about when. And so there are some enemies of using time or transition zones. Uniformity, inappropriateness, lack of attention. There are some tools consumer insight, proactivity, planning, and really ask yourself if your brand or your client's brand can introduce new behaviors at the right time. And so Zipcar, Zipcar um, went, realized that actually going to school in the States, or you know, college or university here, uh, was a real time of change. And that students, even if they didn't have a car, would probably want access to one. So they focused a lot of their marketing around US schools. They went to 250 US schools. And within a year of doing that, their revenue had risen by 30%. OK, another one from my smoking. Uh, we had normal, social proof. Now, what social proof says is that we do what other, others do. We like to copy other people. That's kind of how we're made. Now, thankfully, you guys are the masters of this. You know, brands and creative are absolutely brilliant at making new behaviors the new normal. And so in this field, ask yourself if you can show your consumer lots of action being taken, you know, in everyday life or, you know, at a huge scale through advertising. Again, there are some enemies, novelty, weirdness, invisibility, and some tools, visibility, familiarity, and scale. And ask yourself if your brand can make um, your target behavior visible and normal. So um, I love this example. This is Coca-Cola in Israel uh, put Israel's 10,000 recycling bins on Facebook places. They pimped them up a bit. They kind of put sunflowers and stuff around them, but they, put, they mainly posted them online. And they promised to crown Israel's most active recycler uh, the Recycling King. Thousands of people posted pictures of themselves recycling seen by millions others. And I mean, I find this crazy. If ever you wanted some evidence that people wish to be good and wish to be seen to be good, well, here it is. I mean, it might be a pimped up bin, but it's still a picture of you next to a bin, <laughs> you know? And, you know, I, 
I've, I thought of this the other day as well. I, I was cleaning out my garden two Saturdays ago in that lovely, gorgeous, hot weekend we had. And so on Sunday, I'm going to the dump. And I, I don't know if you've been to the dump recently, but they've shut all of them around London. I was queuing for 40 minutes to get into Smugglers Away, surrounded by other people queuing to get into the dump. And I just thought, what's going on? I mean, I have to go. I've symbolically self-completed. I'm an environmentalist. My family would go, oh! if I just fly-tipped my rubbish instead of disposing of it responsibly. But all these people around me being good citizens and trying to do the good thing. And it's a massive chore. So what happens if we unleash folk on recycling, but with a little bit of fun? Or more specifically, women on clothes recycling? So consumers love having fun. Consumers will make more time for pleasure and leisure and enjoyment than they will for the chores. And again, we've got some kind of uh, pros and cons, some enemies of fun, dullness, necessity, tools, joy, excitement, interest and laughter. Ask yourself if you can bring some enjoyment to sustainable behaviours. If you can inject some kind of glamour and humour and silliness even, comp competition, gamification in your target behaviour. So indulge me for a moment. Imagine you've just found your perfect outfit. Now imagine it costs nothing. And you found this outfit while sharing a bottle of bubbly with friends. Well, this is swishing. This is one of Futera's. Um, and what we did, a swishing party, women bring at least one item of clothes that they'd be proud to pass on and swap them with others who've uh, brought stuff. It's gone global. There are thousands of parties every year from Brazil to UAE to uh, Bedford. <laughs> Uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of clothes are saved from landfill, and of course it's inspired one rather well-known retailer's campaign, shopping. Um, so, but, so and actually, I'll tell you what I did from, it kind of worked so well on me um, that I ended up uh, spending a year swishing. I dived in without thinking about it much at all, but spent a whole year swishing, going to swishing parties instead of actually buying anything. Um, it was pretty tough. I went through the seven stages of swishing grief, from anger and denial to bargaining. If I take you out for dinner, will you buy me a pair of shoes? <laughs> through to finally acceptance. Um, but anyway, I stuck to it using some of these tactics. And now when you look across all of these tactics that are out there, um, it actually boils down to three uber ways in which brands change behavior in this field. You've got persuasion, you've got product, and you've got placement. So persuasion is the one that is kind of most common. Um, the one that you will, that's where you use your marketing to actively influence your audience. You know, the Coca-Cola example, Zipcar, that's all persuasion. Product, um, product's pretty cool, I love this one. Product says that you, or, you, you build in behavior change to the product or service itself. So in using it, the consumer automatically changes their behavior. Um, dry shampoo is one of my favorite examples with that. Women spray it on in the morning, less time in the shower, don't need to wash your hair. Um, it cuts, you know, it means you use less energy and less water, but of course it's, it's never marketed on that. It's marketed on convenience and crazy big hair. So that's product. And the final one is placement, which is really cool. Placement says that you use your marketing and communications to very subtly influence your audience, mainly through peripheral processing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about placement, um, which, you know, I started with my own smoking story, and I'm going to start to close with one of the most famous smoking stories ever, ever told. Um, it's a brilliant example of early, early product and behavioral placement. So, 20, 1929, New York Easter Day Parade. Um, the crowd erupts with these glamorous women striding down Fifth Avenue, chuffing away. Total social taboo for women to smoke outside of the home. Um, sparked huge debate, huge um, conversations, masses of coverage. And, and actually, women across America started taking up smoking as a symbol of emancipation and playing off this era of you know, women's rights. Um, of course, you know, this turned out to be total subterfuge by a guy called Edward Bernies, who um, uh, created this whole campaign, Torches for Freedom. He was 38. He was an American Austrian, 
and he was also the nephew of Freud, which is a little bit less talked about. So he was one of the first to use findings from this very emerging trend of psychology in advertising. And so our industry has benefited massively from psychology over the years. You know, here in this room, we've got some of the world's top creatives. We've been using psychology for years, but to date on a very specific behavior. You know, if you look at Ford and his motor car redesigning our cities, to Apple moving our music online within a generation, to date, our efforts have been mainly focused around the behavior of buying stuff. But I tell you, our industry is transforming. You know, we're riding a wave of brands asking us to help their customers adopt sustainable lifestyles. So, you know, we've heard from Unilever and Puma. It's kind of, it's crazy to think that even, you know, Unilever, FMCG, you know, very recently getting us to shower more in order to use more products is now asking or really even begging the creative community to help fulfill its sustainable living plan. So when you look around, there's a brilliant response starting from creatives. Just to return to the change maker cards, I'm going to flip through these really quickly. We've got Toyota making it high status, Longchamp surprising people with it. We've got Walmart editing it out, Replenish reinventing it, Knight rewarding it, Futera making it fun. But it's not enough. It's really not enough. This is not philanthropy. This is business responding to these mega trends which are out there. This is the new marketing opportunity. So we're going to need the most inventive new product development. We're going to need you know, the most brilliant change concepts, the, the cleverest copy and the wittiest, wittiest visuals. But I know you can do it. This is you. <laughs> you are all fucking legends who will change the world. Yes, that was symbolic self-completion. It is the greatest creative challenge of our time, and I really wish you all the best with it. Thank you.